drop what you know at the door because every day is different. And I think being humble and being able to say, I don't know what I, I don't know, and that's okay. Hello, welcome to The Seasoned RD, a podcast connecting newer professionals in the field of eating disorders to those of us who have been around for a while. I'm your host, Beth Harrell, a certified eating disorders registered dietitian and supervisor. And I'm Abby Brown, a registered dietitian who is newer to the field. I think of myself as a well-seasoned cast iron skillet with wisdom and experience, yet always ready for something new. And I think of myself as an Instapot with innovation and a fresh perspective. This podcast brings both to the table to share ingredients, recipes, and techniques of past and present so we can all be our best for the future. The kettle is heating up. The skillet is on simmer. So join us around the table for true professional nourishment. Abby, ready to stir the pot? Let's do it. Welcome to the Seasoned RD podcast, where today, especially if you are a registered dietitian working in a general hospital setting, I think you will love this discussion with Brooke Butler, registered dietitian, certified eating disorder registered dietitian, and supervisor. Brooke spends a lot of time here sharing how she arrives at goal weight, including transgender, and how growth charts are vital. If, or maybe I should say when, parents or kids are concerned about goal weight, it comes back to fear. Fear that we're pushing them too hard and that relapse is going to happen. However, when the brain is fueled and body distress actually goes down even if body weight is higher. If you're a student in my graduate elective course, just like we describe when prescribing weight loss to cure, and I say this in quote, medical conditions as lazy medicine, recommending goal weight at the 50th percentile for kids and adolescents and teens is lazy nutrition. So we had some excellent conversations about blind weight versus open weights, the subtypes for ARFID, and the word distress comes up in so many places in this episode. Some advice from Brooke is she wishes she had known to seek out more information on eating disorders. And like so many of us, a dietitian training was focused on obesity. And finally, seeking supervision and time with others is her special sauce. A listener comment from Jessica, Dietetic Internship Director. This week in class, I instructed the students to listen to the podcast with you, Abby and Jessica Setnick. You won't need to know eating disorders and other myths learned during formal education. With this being our first Hayes discussion, I'm trying to open the floor for discussion between all of us and honestly just get everyone used to hearing about the topic and the language used. I don't want haze to be something they just touched on during their internship, if that makes sense. Yes, Jessica, that makes great sense. And I, for one, just like in this episode, Brooke mentioned, I'm grateful that you're including these discussions during formal training. So typical disclaimer in this podcast, we bring in medical, nutrition, and therapy professionals who share their passions to pique your interest in available modalities for the field of eating disorders. This show is intended to inform and educate. It is not a substitute for the professional training and supervision required to specialize in the treatment of eating disorders, nor is it a substitute for medical, nutrition, or psychological advice from a professional or specialist. I hope you enjoy this episode with Brooke Butler. Welcome to the Seasoned RD, Brooke Butler. We're so glad to have you. Hi, Beth. Thank you so much. Yes. Can't wait to chat with you. We always appreciate the ERC dietitians. We love y'all. But we'll just ease you into things. So mountains or beach? Oh, gosh. Definitely mountains. I am very (laughs) fair-skinned. The sun and I, I mean, vitamin D is great and all. The sun and I don't get along. So mountains all day. Like, you know, a nice 70 degree day with a cool breeze, hiking in the mountains, no beach, not ever sand, no sun, no, like that's my nightmare. (laughs) And you have the best mountains being in Denver. We sure do. (laughs) I like to think so at least. Yeah. Makes up for the cost of living. (laughs) (laughs) There we go. (laughs) And then breakfast or dinner? Breakfast. For sure. These are, these are great. Like just, you know, I I know (laughs) these questions. Breakfast has the best foods. I'm a sweet tooth, you know, by and large. So pancakes, waffles, all that good stuff. Breakfast for dinner even. So yeah, breakfast. (laughs) Yeah. You're answering them quickly. Um, (laughs) This one may be a little harder. I don't know. Audio book or paper book? Ooh, gosh, that's a, that is harder. 
I might go 50, 50, if that's allowed when, you know, like Kindles and whatnot first came out, I was like, Oh no, the, the appall of having a, you know, electronic book. Like, can you imagine? (laughs) I, I think I'm very similar to a lot of, you know, this type of provider in that, like, I like learning. I like, you know, having a physical thing in my hand and being able to flip through it. But the ease of traveling with a Kindle is so great. The ease of just downloading something versus having to go to the library or go to a bookstore. Who am I kidding? Or, or buy it on Amazon and have it shipped to you. Right. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I would go 50-50 if, if I can. Of course you can, because we were talking about how we work with folks who tend to be very black and white, all or nothing thinking. Yeah. And so yeah. when we can find that in between interconnection. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Okay. So you're a registered dietitian. I am. And I'm going to take you back to mm-hmm. hopefully not traumatize you too much, but back to your <laughs> RD exam, because we have people oh, listening gosh. who yes. are getting ready for theirs or just finishing their internship or uh-huh. um, just passed their RD exam. And so was it number two pencil or a keyboard? <laughs> it was a keyboard. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yep. Yep. I don't remember when they switched over, but I went to my testing center and, you know, it was the longest, what was it? Three hours, three hours of my life. <laughs> yeah. What else do you remember from that day? Honestly, not much. What I remember, this is very random and very not related to like content or anything about the RD exam. But when I left the testing center, and we got our results printed out immediately. So I knew right then that I had passed. There was a, I don't know if you guys have seen those trees that sometimes people will string dollar bills to, to like be a social experiment to see how much people take. And there was one of those just sitting there in the parking lot with all these dollar bills strung all over it. So I saw that as a a good omen, like, oh, this is my career starting. I'm on my way. And I took one dollar bill. Like, I'm like, I'm not going to be that person that takes all the (laughs) money off the tree. (laughs) So that's what I remember from that day is this like good omen you know, Dollar Tree. I love (laughs) it. I wonder, I mean, do you still have that dollar bill as the starter of? I'm sure I, I'm a very like sentimental type hoarder person. Like I save all the paper, all the stuff that like, Ooh, like this is a good memory. I'll want to relive one day. So I'm sure I have it somewhere. I have no idea where. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I'm like that too. And you can go into some of those restaurants where they have dollars on the, the, yeah. (laughs) And I think that when you close a restaurant like that, you need to, you need to keep the dollars. Oh, for sure. (laughs) <laughs> okay. Well, how did you ca- get into the field of nutrition? And then how did you f- get into the field of eating disorders? Yeah. So it was kind of by happenstance. In my undergrad, I actually went into undergrad, you know, as a 18 year old. I don't, what 18 year old actually knows what they want to do? I thought I did. So I went in with a journalism major which then changed pretty quickly to a graphic design major. And then in my sophomore year, I took my like prerequisite health course that everyone has to take that was taught by this like 80 year old man, Myron Carter. I'll never forget him. He was an amazing professor. He, he was just so knowledgeable about health and so passionate about health and very funny, very endearing man. And so that got me thinking, well, this is kind of cool. I like this class. I like this guy. What could I do in this field? So I got to exploring different health careers and then pivoted again to dietetics. So my third major in college, but I landed on dietetics and then continued out through through graduation and then my internship. What got me into eating stores was also kind of random. I did not have good training in my internship, as I think most people do in their, you know, in their DI um, rotations. I, I didn't have any sort of experience. You would have an ink sort of patient maybe come through one of your rotations, but nothing directly targeted towards the specialty patient population, which is a shame. And there are more internships nowadays that are totally eating sort of focused, which is amazing. We've had some dietitians come through that have been through those programs, which is very cool, but not, that was not my case. So I did my regular dietetic internship. I landed my first job at the university of Missouri's hospital in Columbia, Missouri. My services were the gen med floor and then the psych center. So interestingly enough, 
when Ingsor patients typically land in hospitals, they're going to go usually in one of those two locations. So I saw the bulk of these sort of patients in the hospital that came through. I feel like as a dietitian and that's working in a regular hospital, you either love the sort of patients or you, you hate them. And, and there's not really an in-between. So I, I did enjoy working with those patients. I saw the incredible disservice that most hospitals, you know, they, they don't typically know how to treat patients with eating disorders because of the stigma, because of kind of associations with, you know, still associations with this is a, a privileged disease. This is whatever. So, you know, I, I liked working with them, so I, I got them all. And then, so I was at the University of Missouri's hospital for three years before I decided to make the move out to Denver and was lucky enough to land a job at ERC. And I've been here for nine years now. Oh my gosh. And you're a nutrition yeah. manager there. Yeah. I am. Yeah. So I oversee our crew. So I'm the nutrition manager of our Juniper eating disorder location, which is child and adolescent only. So my entire career solely eating source has only been child and adolescent focused. I was a regular dietitian there for gosh, what was it? Two years. And then I've been in, in the manager position for now about seven years overseeing our crew of about six child and adolescent dietitians. So awesome. And this yeah. is, I don't think we've had a specific pediatric inpatient eating disorder dietitian on. And so what do you see in your job that you really want newer clinicians, seasoned, highly seasoned clinicians to know about kids and adolescents? That's such a good question. The The first thing that came to mind was like drop what you know at the door because every day is different. And you even now, I, I, every day I'm still learning something new about the patients, our families. So we are a FBT informed treatment approach. So we are empowering the caregivers and the parents to be the agents of change for their kiddo. So really, you know, if, if people aren't aware of FBT, I will, you know, be an FBT supporter until the day I die. It's, it's a fantastic way to help kiddos in recovery. But really, I think being humble and being able to say, I don't know what I I don't know, and that's okay. I've been so privileged to have the bulk of my eating disorder education in this setting where there are truly giants in the field of eating disorders that I get to work alongside every single day and I get to, to grow from every single day. And that's such a blessing. I would not be the clinician I am today if I hadn't had that experience. And, you know, again, there's still so much research we need to do so much of our own learning we need to do. So it's such a skill to, I like to coach my new RDs on, Hey, come with questions. There's no bad question. I know that's a, you know, a nuanced saying, but truly like it's much more well-received for you to ask your questions versus assuming, you know, everything. Come with questions Mm -hmm. and don't, and drop what you know at the door. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting that you bring up FBT. We were just chatting with another group about FBT. What does that look like at ERC? How do y'all bring the family in? Yeah, great question. So we recognize that it's pretty anti-FBT in that we're at a higher level of care, right? So like, yeah, it's an outpatient model. So it's adapted, of course. We recognize that there's kiddos that are too sick to do it at home that need a higher level of care, need the 24 hour containment. Their parents sometimes also just need a break, right? So it's a lot to ask parents to be completely weight restoring their, their kiddo that might be 40 pounds underweight. So we, you know, bring the kids in, we really do our our best to involve the parents as much as we can in this hybrid higher level of care and FBT informed approach. So the dietitians are holding the meal planning aspect like as the proxy uh, for the parents for the first couple of weeks until the kid gets settled in, parents can have some rest and respite. And then we're transitioning that back to the parents for providing education. If they haven't had prior education on meal planning for their, for their kiddo. So we're providing the education and then we're asking the parents to step back in and be making those choices for the patient. It's pretty amazing to see a lot of times our kids 
they think the dietitian is picking the meals. And then when they realize their parents are picking the meals, it's like, oh, wait a minute. Like my parents are picking these meals. Um, they can go, you know, one of two ways. Like they're like, oh, okay. Like I'm going to start eating now. Or it's like, oh, wait, like now I'm super angry at my parents. And now the dietitian's cool. <laughs> so yeah. So our, our main focus at the higher level of care is medical stabilization, getting them back to what their expected body weight would have been um, had they not suffered from, you know, the assault from malnutrition and then stepping them down to a low, lower level of care as, as soon as we can. We recognize that it's not a normal thing for a kid to be away from their family, for them to be away from their real life, their, their normal day to day. And we don't want kids to identify with being in treatment. We don't want that to become fused with their identity. So we do a lot of work individuating. So kind of skipping over into the therapeutic realm of things, but you guys know, like the <laughs> dietitians and Ingsor treatment have to have that therapeutic hat as well. So a lot of the work that the dietitians are doing individually, with the patients age appropriate, of course, is, Hey, like, look what the Ingsor has taken away from you. Mm. Look what your values are. Look how you've deviated from your values to align with eating sort and how can we get you back to that? So we do a lot of that kind of work kind of in tandem with the therapist. Yeah. You said so many things and I'm taking notes <laughs> as you're talking. And one of them was, and now the dietitian's cool because <laughs> that is one of those things that when I first started, someone told me, be ready to be hated. Mm -hmm. And I didn't like that. I remember thinking, because <laughs> I always started inpatient. It was in a hospital in Kansas City that had a program uh -huh. and the hospital's not even around anymore, but it was really we didn't have a lot of resources, but I mm -hmm. knew that I, not to take it personally. Yeah. So that that's one thing. So when the parents start picking it and the, the kid, the kiddo knows, <laughs> and all of a sudden <laughs> now you can be cool. Yeah. And then you mentioned getting people back to go away. How do you know what that yeah. is? Great question. So we are such an advocate for obtaining growth data. So, you know, we're not comparing you know, for using the fruit metaphor, we're not comparing apples to oranges, we're comparing apples to apples, right? So we're comparing the individual child's own growth with where they should be at this point in time, assuming their growth had been normal prior to the onset of the eating disorder. So the dietitians, the, the clinical assessment therapists, even prior to admission, the case managers, when they arrive to the treatment setting, we're all pushing so hard to obtain any kind of growth data we can. And then we're painting a picture as far as what did their growth look like prior to the onset of or was it normal? Were there abnormalities over the course of their growth and development? And what was the explanation for that? So oftentimes my growth charts, when I'm looking at them, I have all the pieces of information plotted out. It is a mess of information. There is, there's notes all over the place. Some menarche was here, onset of competitive sports was here. Parents' divorce was here because maybe their intake suffered in that regard. Sibling was born here with maybe traumatic medical history. Lots of variables can play into what goes on in the kind of interpretation of the growth data. So I mark it all up. I like to have a clear picture. I know, you know, Dr. Michael Spalding Barclay, he is our medical director and he and I oftentimes are just putting our heads together like, hey, like, let's look at these. Let's kind of talk back and forth about what we each kind of think about these growth charts, especially the funky ones. We're like, man, like it could be that this percentile is where they need to be, but maybe this percentile also makes sense. So really we're pushing for a really ro robust record of the kids' own growth. We, I would say there's no like incorrect data in a sense that I've had moms like scour prior dance costume measurements and send those to me to be I able was to gonna plot. ask you what do you do <laughs> with incomplete plots? Mm -hmm. Yep. Um in my experience thus far it's been pretty rare that a kid has just not been at a pediatrician their you know entire life. We've had a couple that you know they they might choose to live a, a different lifestyle than what would be our, our traditional mainstream way of doing medical. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. Pediatric medical care in this country. So I, I found it to be pretty rare that we've not been able to find any data. So we've got our own, you know, growth chart calculators. You can also plot it by hand, but you know, right. why do that when you can just plug in the numbers and it'll spit it out for you. Yeah. So yeah, you know, we are pestering parents. We are pestering the pediatrician's offices until we get the, the data that we need. I've got a kiddo right now that 
you know, they've moved around a lot. And so we've literally we've gotten release of information for four different pediatricians that she's been at in her life. And so we're yeah. hounding each of them. <laughs> and you know what's so hard? I don't know if you've noticed this too, but when places went from written, like where they would mm-hmm. plot with a pen or a pencil mm-hmm. on there to electronic, yep. then they archived all the written stuff. And so yep. I'm, I just, you know, make sure that I ask and say, I want you to go into the archive. I need to mm-hmm. see that. Yep. Because they Absolutely. won't then transfer it over to the electronic record. Absolutely. If there's any kind of missing chunk of time, I'm like, what's going on here? And where can we find that data? <laughs> here, sometimes a kiddo will say, well, I got my period back. Why do I ah. have to keep gaining weight? Yeah. What's your response to that? <laughs> that happens almost every day. And the parents too, right? So it's not just the kid. So in our responses with our kids, which I think a lot will change with the Cures Act, which I'm like, you know, dietitian, I'm not that like warm to change. So I'm, I'm pretty nervous about how, you know, the Cures Act is going to impact care as we know it. Not to say we can't pivot, but I don't even know how I got on that tangent, but kids, we oftentimes don't kind of talk that much in detail. One of our, our mantras at my location is no dates, no weights. And really that is just saying we're not really sharing like the the number pieces of information with you. So we're not, you know, telling patients months in advance when their projected step down date is because they're going to be perseverating on that date. And then we're not going to be able to do any good therapeutic work. Same thing with weights. Again, this is one of those things where we deviate from FBT, but we're not most of the time at our level of care, the kids aren't ready yet to be able to know that information. So a lot of times we talk about the underlying distress of the importance that the sort of places on the number and we explore the distress and explore kind of what the number means to them. A lot of times we don't, don't get in these back and forth arguments with our kiddos and tend to just kind of shut the conversation down with parents. We definitely are providing all of the education because they're going to be the ones that have to hold this. And if they're not agreeing with the goal weight, which again happens every week, at least I would, even venture to say it happens every day. We're hearing about, you know, a different family that's like, oh, we have to have the goal weight conversation with them. So a lot of times, again, it's based on their own distress of, I don't know if I'll be able to tolerate my kid, their distress in their new body. So it's providing all the psycho ed, also all of the kind of medical education that we know. So I like to spout off the random things like, well, of course, you know, we have two separate growth charts, height and weight for reasons. As we see, like explain just the basics of growth charts, as we see their age increase, their, their weight should also increase continuously for, you know, blah, blah, blah reasons. So bone density, speaking to that blood volume, increasing, speaking to that. So, you know, getting into the medical side of things, but also again, wearing that therapeutic hat, our dietitians are very skilled at talking with parents through their own distress about whatever the number might be. We're going to take a quick break to recognize our sponsor for today, not only for the amazing care that they provide for our clients, but also for the educational opportunities that they provide to us first by sponsoring podcasts like this, but also if you're not on their mailing list, you will want to be. They provide a lot of free resources, continuing education for professionals. So Eating Recovery Center and Pathlight Mood has 31 sites located in eight different states. Their fully integrated healthcare system provides a full spectrum of behavioral health services. Eating Recovery Center specializes in treating patients struggling with eating disorders, including anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa, diabulimia, binge eating disorder, ARFID, and co-occurring disorders. And Pathlight specializes in treating patients with mood and anxiety disorders, trauma-related disorders, and co-occurring substance use disorders. ERC Pathlight provides intensive treatment programs that are tailored for patients of all ages, ethnicities, gender identities, and expressions. For more information, you can visit our show notes or their website at eatingrecovery.com and pathlightbh for behavioralhealth.com. My child started her period. Why can't, why do we have to push beyond them? Yeah. So 
I, I understand that you are concerned to continue making your child gain weight because it's an uncomfortable process and because they already don't like their body. I can see as a parent that you're worried about trying to help your kiddo manage their distress when they become really dysregulated. And yet it's of utmost importance that we continue progressing to their expected body weight. As we can see clearly on their growth chart, they were growing normally at X percentile prior to the onset of the eating disorder. So it's crucial that we get them back there for restoration of all body processes, not only for a return of menstruation. I also like to hit in there just our, our species has been through periods of famine and we've continued on as a race, like we haven't died off. So it's not a great predictor of being at an appropriate body weight because we know that, you know, women can menstruate even at low body weights and that doesn't go away for everybody. Oh, I love that. And I caught the emotion focused yeah. <laughs> because, because. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Also love some good EFFT. It feels like there can be a lot of projection sometimes on that piece from a parent onto what their child's weight quote unquote should be. Do you get mm-hmm. a lot of that? Sure do. Sure do. It's always so fascinating to me because this just was not my experience growing up. Luckily, you know, oftentimes parents will reflect back, you know, when I was 16, I only weighed 102 pounds. Like, why, like, how do you know that first of all? And that's such a strange thing. Like just in my mind, like what a strange thing to be associating that your kids should also be exactly the same as you when wait, you're only 50%, you know, your kid, they've got 50% of their other parent too. So yeah, I, I do see a lot of projection and just this fear. I think it all comes back down to fear of I'm afraid my kid will relapse. I'm afraid we're pushing them too hard. So trying to get them to see that the relapse factor actually is much more prevalent if we leave them at a weight that's not appropriate for their body. We've heard that stat before. And so it's so good to hear you hone that in. When I'm looking at people's distress and recovery record is something that I use. I know Eating Mm -hmm. Recovery Center does, at least for their adults. Mm -hmm. And body distress and weight are inverse. Right. So someone can come in at a very low weight and their body dissatisfaction scores are high and the EPSIs. And then it's the opposite when they start fueling their body and their mm-hmm. weight actually goes higher that their body distress can decrease. Right. Right. It's fueling Absolutely. the brain. You've got to yeah. get it back online. Right. And so just you know, sharing that with parents, like we're actually depriving them of that potential if we don't get them all the way there. Oh, depriving them of that potential. Oh my gosh. What is the Cures Act? Oh goodness. So the Cures Act is (laughs) this, I'm pretty sure it's nationwide, this act that is going to be in place, allowing patients to see the intention is good as is most things that tend to not have as good of outcome in the mental health field. Mm. So um, it allows patients access to see information in their medical record much easier. So allows patients to see things in real time. So via the patient portal. So we are highly concerned, of course, that patients can then Mm -hmm. log into their portal, see their weight that day, see their last family note. Mm -hmm. So I think it's just going to change a lot of things about especially under the guise of FBT, how we are, you know, treating our patients essentially. For Um, sure. Yeah. And that is one thing that now I'm feeling like you're coming over to the outpatient world (laughs) because when I worked inpatient, it was so supportive. Like every, the bathrooms are locked after meals Mm -hmm. and everyone's, you know, if they're sleeping or if they're exercising in their bed or, you know, you've just got a pulse on everything. And then you come work in the outpatient and you have no idea what's happening. And so you, we can ask people to not focus on the number. Right. However, even if parents take something away, um, those kids and teenagers can go to a friend's house, grandparents' house. Absolutely. I've had people pull scales off of this shelf at Walmart and just stand on it to mm-hmm. get a glimpse of what it might be. Mm-hmm. So it's just data for us. That's kind of what I use with with my clients is it's, it's data. It's interesting that you are doing that. 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Same with the numberless scale. I don't know if you all use that. So our virtual intensive outpatient dietitians use that somewhat frequently, I believe. I'm not too well versed in, you know, how often they're using that, but yeah. our weights are, they're all blind weights. We're not using that specific scale at our inpatient level, but for um, sure, you don't have to, you get to yeah. do the real deal. And that yeah. is, uh, but yeah, so guiding people if, and it's still numberless, but we can have clients stand on it several times a day mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and it's just a, maybe a compulsion, maybe it's obsessive right. compulsive kind of behavior and it's just right. data for us. It's interesting. Yep. Yeah, Absolutely. And, you know, it's just one of those things. There's, there's always going to be things that come up that we have to be able to be flexible and and pivot. Again, I I think I said earlier, it's not the easiest, I think, for a lot of dietitians, especially ones that have been set in our ways for a while. Um, And yet we can do it. We can rise to the challenge. We can. We'll do it. We fi- <laughs> we've done it. We figure it out yep. before. Yep. So what are some diagnoses that you see? And maybe uh, we were talking a little bit earlier about ARFID. That's one that's not talked about very much. Mm-hmm. People understand anorexia nervosa pretty well. That's where a lot of the treatment or the studies were early on mm-hmm. in the field of eating disorders. And ARFID and binge eating disorder are two of the newer ones. Yep. Yeah. So we do see, we do see ANR, we do see bulimia nervosa. Unfortunately, we don't at at higher level of care, we don't see a lot of binge eating and it's really a a disservice and a, you know, example of how the the medical system in the United States is failing us because we're, you know, insurance, we take insurance and a lot of times insurance doesn't cover that support, which is awful. So that's an unfortunate byproduct. We don't see a lot of binge eating disorder kiddos. ARFID, yes, we have seen a significant amount of ARFID kiddos present to us, you know, with the latest DSM. I love these kids. You know, we have our different subtypes, you know, what is the feel? What's the flavor of their ARFID? Why are they choosing to, you know, interact with their food in certain ways? Is it a uh, phobic? response. We've had a kid just recently that has had several anaphylactic allergies her entire life. And so she has started to eliminate foods based on the fear that she will receive foods that contain any of her allergens. You know, her palate has just become completely restrictive. Our, you know, kind of stereotypical adolescent male gamer that spends all day in their room that just doesn't have a drive to eat. And then our, our kind of stereotypical, what you think of when you think of our fit as I am very picky regarding textures, flavors, temperatures, smells. So that's, I think, typically what people think of first when they think of ARFID, but we do kind of differentiate between the different subtypes. And then interestingly, we also see, we, we of course see mixed type where they have multiple presentations of the different subtypes. But then we also see, especially in our younger, typically female kiddos, they might have a flair for anorexia. So they might be heading that way, but maybe historically they've always had, you know, one of the ARFID subtypes and we call that ARFID plus. So kind of on our radar, like, oh goodness, like this kid is starting to say some things that sound like they could be developing body image issues. And then a couple of years later, they might readmit to us with full-blown ANR. So it's very interesting. Very interesting. How do you treat them differently or do you treat them the same? I mean, nutritionally, yeah. what's the plan? Yeah. So we do treat them the same in a lot of regards and also different in a lot of regards. So the similarities, I think, with the way we treat our ARFID patients versus the other eating disorder diagnosis patients. We don't have specialty programming for our ARFID patients. The, the kind of underlying theme of all of our groups, all of the kind of things during the day that the patients are doing, it's all distress tolerance skills, right? So same. no matter yeah. what your eating no. disorder looks like, right. you're going to be engaging in it because you're trying to manage your distress. So it's applicable to every eating disorder patient, no matter what their diagnosis is. Right. The one group that we do take them out of is the body image group. Body image, right. (laughs) Okay. So programming wise, that's the the one difference, but really all the therapeutic skill groups, they can utilize just as effectively as our other eating disorder patients. Meal planning wise, a little bit more interesting. 
So we do a lot of hierarchy work and we do a lot of exposure work. So primarily the dietitians, their work with the patient is all exposures. So we're not doing our, you know, traditional, let's sit down in my office and let's chat about, you know, your values and how you sort of has come in and taken them away from you. Let's chat about nutrition education. We're doing hands-on exposures with them to increase their ability to regulate, again, their distress when they're presented with new food items, novel food items, items that they've intentionally eliminated. And then their meal plans, we typically start them on a meal plan that reflects their safe foods, their, their accepted foods, their preferred foods. And then as we're doing these exposures, we build up their meal plan to be inclusive of those foods that we've successfully done exposures to. Yeah. Because once you eat it, you have to keep eating it. You got to keep doing it. (laughs) Keep doing it. And regulating distress, that is part of of all of them. And I was waiting for you to say something about the body image because that's the one piece that's different for those with with ARFID, at least in the diagnostic Mm -hmm. criteria, which as dietitians, we don't have to worry about the diagnosis. We really just, and, and, and the regulating distress, I wrote that down and circled it because what you were talking about is where dietitians worry that they might be going over their scope of practice if you're doing that emotional work with them. So how do you, how do you come to grips with that? Yeah. Yeah. I talk all the time about this, especially with my my newer dietitians. So I like to say as a dietitian in the eating disorder field, you have to be okay talking about emotions and therapists in the eating disorder field have to be okay talking about food right? Like there's such an overlap and we can't be afraid to talk about those things. Of course, there are boundaries. Of course, there are things that I'm going to immediately pivot to the therapist and and kind of shut those conversations down. And yet it is so intertwined. That is a skill that has to be present for a dietitian, I feel, to be successful in the eating disorder realm. So being able to, to speak to some of those therapeutic modalities, be able to speak to, you know, your coping skill tool set, your anxiety tools, whatever is going to help you regulate that is not the eating disorder. Mm -hmm. So recognizing that that is typically one of the kind of maintaining factors of the illness, recognizing that, and then helping the kiddos pivot to more adaptive coping skills. For sure. What do you, do you have an example of something that you might pivot over to the therapist? What comes to mind immediately are are things like trauma, things that would just be completely out of our scope. Gosh, what else? I feel like a lot of, of things you're able, as time progresses, you're able to interweave kind of back into something that is relevant to the dietitian's kind of lane, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think anything, you know, that's, that's strictly, you know, diagnosis kind of based um, kind of that therapy realm. Um, Trauma is the one that comes to mind. Trauma is huge. And the other uh, one that came up for me most recently was someone talking about their vacation and how hard it was on a relational level. They didn't use Mm. those words, but they were talking, you could see the distress in Mm. about how that went. And so I asked, when's your next appointment with your therapist? Yeah. Because that's going to be an important piece of it. And like you said, did you end up changing your eating because of this distress? Right. Right. So you, we can always bring it back to food, eating, weight, those kinds of discussions. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think the part of our fit, you mentioned of the stereotypical gamer. That's huge right now. I feel like I'm getting a lot of that. Could use a whole research study on that. Oh, absolutely. We need to use research studies on everything, everything. in eating disorders. <laughs> but yeah, you're absolutely right. I find that those kids are, are sometimes the hardest ones, especially within the ARFID realm. Just anecdotally, I find that oftentimes they're the ones that are least interested in making a change. It's like, well, you got to eat. <laughs> you got to eat six times a day. We, you know, we do three meals, three snacks. I I find that those kiddos sometimes are the hardest because again, of so much is coming out about screens, about our addiction, for lack of a better word, to technology, to the apps, the games, and the, the feedback that kids are receiving, that adults are receiving, anybody is receiving that makes you keep coming back to keep getting that, that reward. So of course they're, they're sitting in front of their screens all day. I tell parents this all the time. It's, 
a really unfortunate time, I, I feel, for kids to be kids because there's such access to technology and there's a lot of scary technology. We have a whole course for parents on technology and ways to, for them to watch out for eating disorder stuff to be looking kind of just at their kids' fingertips. Absolutely. Yeah. It, and it is different with them versus, well, I don't know, like a kiddo who's playing a sport where you can motivate them like, oh yeah, you know, this is really going to help you with your right. game, blah, blah, blah. Right. right. The motivation is a yep. tricky one. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you have been so insightful. This has been such a fun chat with you. But before we let you go, I do have a wrap up question for you. Sure. If you were to take yourself back to entering the field of eating disorders, what do you wish you would have known then that you do Mm. know? Mm -hmm. Great question. I wish I would have known to seek out more information, as, as strange as that sounds, but Truly, again, I I feel that internships are coming around, the didactic programs are coming around, and yet eating disorders still are not a focus of uh, education. Definitely when I was going to school and in my internship, it was all obesity focused. Obesity medicine had an entire bariatric rotation, but I didn't have an eating disorder rotation. So I, I feel like I wish I had known to seek out more information on, especially this patient population. But then I think that applies to, you know, the sky's the limit, all kinds of other diagnoses, all kinds of other specialty patient populations that don't get the the kind of, you know, on paper education experience that other diagnoses receive, which is, you know, it is what it is. And we can do better, I feel like in this field. I think we're starting to see that shift over time. For sure. You know, I love that seeking out more information and that you and I connected in different ways over the years, but we did share a patient. You were talking about growth charts. This this particular patient was transgender. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the weight loss was missed and attributed to the transition. Mm -hmm. And so I remember reaching out to you and saying, how did you come up with a goal weight? And and so it's even seeking out information about specific cases like that, because we see more and more of it as we open up. But one other thing I was just thinking of was I wish I had known also to seek supervision. I think that is such a huge, a huge part of, of growing as clinicians, especially if you are in your own practice Mm -hmm. um, and not surrounded by other providers that you can just bounce ideas off of. I I think that is is such a huge one and really Mm. important, especially for new, new providers. Yeah. And I did not cue her to do this. I didn't kick her (laughs) under the table or send her a chat in the zoom to say that that's the whole purpose, not the whole purpose, but of this podcast is supervision is getting in, making sure that you feel supported, that you, this is hard work. Mm -hmm. We're not taught that therapists have to be supervised for their licensure. And then to, to have additional supervision, just, it's just more school. Mm -hmm. It feels like sometimes, but when people get into it, they won't stop. And, and I, you know, I'm a lifelong supervisee and um, provide supervision for folks. And then um, just put myself into places where I can keep learning. So thank you for that, Brooke. Yeah, absolutely. All right. We are so glad you joined us. Thank you so much for having me, Beth and Abby. It was a pleasure to chat with you this morning. Let's lean on each other and learn from each other so we can grow together as professionals in this field of eating disorders. If you want to connect with me for supervision or membership with monthly content, please find me at bethherald.com slash professionals.